stand in the river, current gentle and slow. Send your troubles down water. My mother and I immigrated to the United States in 88, and so I grew up in Maryville, and I heard a Highlander, but it's in your backyard. Um, so I didn't appreciate it. I didn't, I wasn't focused on that until I went to Berea. Uh, when I went to Berea, um, I got a wonderful perspective. This year is my second year attending um, Highlanders. At first I was with Highlanders uh, Season of Fire 2007. This is my second year back um, the, during the 75th reunion. And I'm very glad to be here for, because first of all, what makes me feel so great to be here is that simply because you all feel like you're a family. You're all united as one. First, second of all, you get to sing, you get to chat. You <laughs> Oh my God, you just love one another. You know, when I came here to work in the Highlander archives and I was reading Miles' notes from, uh, that he did in Denmark on these little, uh, you know, and I remember the day I found him and I was totally fascinated with these little note cards, you know, that he wrote to himself when he was in Denmark. And it says, um, get a place, go back and start. That was one thing that was on the note cards. And then the other thing is when he was working in the little town of Ozone, Tennessee, and he was working with this community organization, and he began to think about if people came together and talked about their problems that they didn't have to have the answers. And I remember when I was doing that in the archives and I thought, no, this is way too simple. He must have had in his mind a worked out, because Miles was very cagey and a very smart man. And I thought, I'm sure he had this worked out better than this that you know and as I stayed here and worked here and and worked with Miles over that you know time that I was here I realized that that is that is in essence his philosophy of work and that as long as Highlander does that as long as it really trusts people to come together to solve their own problems that there will be democracy in the making here and that that's really what to me that's what Highlander is all about We'd better listen to the voices from the mountains Trying to tell us what we just might need to know Cause the Empire's days are numbered if we're counting And the people just get stronger blow by blow We'd better listen when they talk about strip mining we're going to turn the rolling hills to acid clay. And if we're preaching all about that silver lining, we'll be preaching till the hills are stripped away. There's always a place for all of us to work in unity. And I'm asking us to understand that just like we the young folks 45 years ago, you know, came in with new ideas New energy moved this whole thing to another level. The young folks today is willing, ready, and able to take this thing from where we have carried it to another level, but they ain't quite figured it out as to how they're going to deal with us who is still sitting there being gatekeepers. So for all of you young folks that's in here, you let them know that you got it from Hollis. A guy that's got a lot of years, but he's still young, said to the young folks, what you have to do is respectfully talk to the old folks and ask them to get out of the way. And if they don't get out of the way, respectfully move around them and do what needs to be done because the struggle is much bigger than any of us that is a part of the struggle. Thank you.
immigrant rights work. Immigrant rights work. My mom was a, an organizer in North Carolina around immigrant organizing, and she really, she was an organizer that was involved with Highlander. She was invited, and I was like 14 at the time, getting sort of dragged to events, and then eventually became more and more uh, sort of deeply involved with them through and through student action with farm workers and through the Highlander Center. I got involved in the civil rights movement in a small way, probably in 1959 with the NAACP in Mississippi. And then in early 1961, actively got involved with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And it was through the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that I was introduced to Highlander. I like being introduced to Highlander in the South when it, where it wasn't a place. And then I liked coming to the place and finding the home or the core of that dispersal. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know it was more than 10 years ago. And it was a gathering of labor uh, educators and activists who were also popular education uh, practitioners. And I don't even know how I got on the guest list, really. Because when I walked in the room, I didn't know nobody up in there. And I think that is what Highlander has been and will continue to be, a place where we can gather and pull together forces, think, strategize, and move. Um, and I have had some of the most important conversations and relationship building here as anywhere across the South. So I'm really um, I'm thrilled to be here and represent and continue to um, support Highlander. And well, we were involved in the uh desegregation movement in the 50s. And that was very exciting because, of course, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and Pete Seeger you know, were all coming at that time. And in, even Mrs. Roosevelt, you know. So I came out to Highlander today because um, I was kind of burnt out in the work that I was doing. I'm a physician. I do a lot of HIV prevention work. Um, and I read the long haul at a critical time when I needed to. And I was very excited about the ideas and invested in using popular education what I was doing, so I came to check it out. And I've come to many workshops, and I found those formulas there. And it had something to do with this idea that when you came to Highlander, you brought with you the knowledge of what you needed to know to deal with questions you needed to raise, you knew enough to be able to share that with other people who might be doing the same thing in their community. And Hollander might have two or three other people who might actually be supportive, expansive, who were not of your generation or not of your particular movement. And these were like resource people. And it had to do with something about, you do not need to lecture to people about what's going on in their lives. You do need to give them support to find time, often away from the intensity of the day-to-day -day combat, to actually try to understand, name clearly for themselves what they were doing, and raise questions about were there other things they could be doing? Was there something they needed to learn? It was an amazing kind of experience for me. When there is beauty in the person, there is harmony in the whole. When there is harmony in the whole. It also has been an umbrella where other processes can happen at Highlander. I think that is one of the things why we are celebrating 75 years. Because it, it hasn't been, Highlander hasn't been obsessed with power, of being power and controlling and leading and being it. But more a place where people can come, work on their own processes and also continue them wherever they are going. So it's, it's this kind of an umbrella where things are born or they are strengthened and then they keep happening somewhere else. You walk into the mall, you don't agree to respect everybody there. There's not an unsaid rule or unsaid principle, I guess. I mean, 
walking into that tent, you're accepting everybody in there. And we are not often put in places where we are fully accepted unconditionally. So I think that's what I and you are feeling. <laughs> It always goes where the action is, really. I wanted to come here because it's the, the thing that legends are made of. I mean, this is like our cultural mecca. Uh, in, in many ways, for me, in terms of the progressive leftist, black liberation, civil rights, you know, unionizing, organizing uh, efforts in this country. always on the cutting edge and so if you want to go to the cutting edge you go to Ireland <laughs> Thank you for being here. I'm really excited to be here this evening. I want to start by talking, going back to 1932 when Highlander started on the Cumberland Plateau in Middle Tennessee. Two young men in their 20s met with a 61-year-old woman college president seeking her support to loan them her property to start a different kind of education center. It was during the Great Depression in one of the poorest counties in the entire country and it was the young men's dream to start an education center for adults that would be focused on changing society. Launched as the Highlander Folk School and now known as the Highlander Research and Education Center, Highlander now celebrates its 80th anniversary, still as a world-renowned beacon for progressive organizing, a standard bearer for popular education, participatory action research, and cultural organizing, and as Emeritus Board Member Scott Bates said in the film, always on the cutting edge. On behalf of the current Highlander board and staff, I bring greetings to the people of Virginia Tech and the Blacksburg community. I'm humbled to be with you this evening, and I stand here on the shoulders of, and in honor and memory of, the many people who have built Highlander's work, many whose names we know, and many more com community voices over these past 80 years whose names we don't know, People who for eight decades have stepped up to do the sacred work of working for fairness and justice for their families and their communities and their people. So thank you to Community Voices, the Institute for Policy and Governance, Virginia Tech for inviting me. Thank you to the entire Community Voices team, uh, people I met on the phone and in person, and with particular thanks to Max and Andy for your work. And thank you to each of you for being here this evening. It does seem appropriate that as the director of Highlander that I would get to be part of a series entitled Community Voices because that is the story of Highlander, the idea of Highlander that mattered. 
That is the idea of the community voices, of listening closely to those voices to hear what they have to say, think, and need, and amplifying those voices through skills building and relationship building and take, taking action together. Highlander's history is full of everyday heroes and heroines in the work for justice, and it comes through our methodology. Our classroom is round, and our desks are rocking chairs. We bring people together to learn from each other. The simplest, most basic, we bring people together to learn from each other. But it's also very complex. People talk about their lives, look for themes and patterns in each other's experiences, develop relationships, strategies, and actions, and then go back to their local communities with more information, more skills, more strengths, more connections, and sometimes more courage, hope, and inspiration that they didn't before think possible. This is why the name of my talk this evening is Did Horton Hear a Who? An exploration of the small and mighty voices of the Highlander Center, making change for 80 years. In Dr. Seuss's story, that Horton is an elephant who listens to those who can't, others cannot hear. Even though you can't see or hear them at all, a person's a person, no matter how small. In doing so, Horton the elephant is ridiculed and eventually forced into a cage by other animals in the jungle for believing in something that they are unable to see or hear. In the Highlander story, our Horton, Miles Horton, one of the young men who approached the college woman president, also heard voices that some would wish to go away, that some would say did not matter. In the summer of 1927, Miles went to the small town of Ozone to organize a vacation Bible school. He became aware of the many problems the community faced, how the timber and coal resources were depleted, how the corporations who depleted those resources supplanted a neighborly barter system with the need for money, how those laid off from mines and lumber camps struggled to get jobs in textile mills, and how the families were suffering in poverty. He wanted to help, and so he invited the parents of children in his Bible school to come to church one night to talk. They came from miles around. Many walked, walking at dusk for those miles, following a long day's work. Horton's focus was on getting them comfortable enough to share and speak, using storytelling and singing to open things up. They talked to each other. They asked questions. How could jobs be found? Could trees grow again on hillsides ravaged by clear cutting? How do you test a well for typhoid? The more they met and talked, the more they realized that for almost every question, there was someone in the community who knew the answer or knew where to go get the answer. The sessions continued to happen and grew to the point that the national church office of the Vacation Bible School accused Miles of padding his num attendance numbers in the reports that he gave to the national office. From this idea, and after a journey that took Miles Horton to seminary and to study the Dutch citizenship schools, Miles, with other people, founded the Highlander Folk School based on this premise that has been mentioned in the opening remarks and the film, that we have the answers we seek within ourselves and that those most affected by a problem can and should lead the efforts to solve that problem. A couple of years later, a woman named Zelfia Johnson came to Highlander, and she then married Miles Horton. Zelfia was a person in Highlander's earliest history who understood the power and necessity of integrating music, culture, and art to Highlander's education and organizing work. And she told this story about community voices rising to the occasion. Down in Chattanooga, some clothing workers had organized and asked for recognition the company refused, and they went out on strike. They asked us to come down from Mon Eagle to help keep the strike going. It was decided to have a Washington birthday parade since the workers felt they were striking for freedom, economic freedom. There was a minister in the parade, a band, children, and strikers. We were marching two by two behind the band, and when we marched by the mill, they opened up on us with a machine gun. Several people were hit. Highlander's librarian was shot in the ankle. I looked around and the police had disappeared. There had been quite a few of them too. One of them was lying in a ditch and I said to him, what are you doing down there? He said, lady, I've got a wife and three kids. And about five minutes after the firing stopped, 
A few of us stood up at the mill and started singing. And in about 10 minutes, people began to come out from behind the barns and the little stores around there, and we stood together and kept singing, We Shall Not Be Moved. And that's what won them union recognition. We don't know all the names of those people who came out from behind the barns and little stores after just being shot at by a machine gun. But we do know that some of those everyday folks didn't hide in a ditch. They stood up and they sang. They gave volume to their community voices. Later, Highlander's board of directors, in alignment with the staff, would reconstitute the director of Highlander's work more directly and strongly toward race both for what was happening in the South, and that you could not build a unified labor movement nor a unified people's movement without dealing with race and racism. One of the areas of work to come out of listening to community voices was launching the citizenship schools. In the 1950s, Septima Clark and Esau Jenkins from South Carolina attended a workshop at Highlander on the United Nations. Clark was a school teacher fired for registering people to vote. Jenkins owned a hotel and restaurant on Johns Island and also drove a bus providing transportation for domestic workers and farm laborers to get back and forth to the mainland for work. The United Nations was one thing, but Jenkins wanted to lift up the key, the key issue of literacy and how the literacy test was keeping African Americans from voting. He shared the story about trying to teach reading and writing to people on that bus ride to and from the mainland so they could register to vote, and he asked Kylander's help in starting a night school. Out of that gathering came plans for the citizenship schools. When they got ready to hire a teacher for that first citizenship school, Septima Clark suggested her cousin, Bernice Robinson. Bernice Robinson was a beautician, and black beauticians had status in the community and played key leadership roles because they owned their own businesses and did not depend on white people for their income. Robinson was reluctant. She said she couldn't do it because she wasn't a trained teacher, and they said, that's exactly why we want you. You know the people and will know how to reach them. Robin started, Robinson started the first class in the back room of a cooperative store on Johns Island with 14 students meeting twice a week. Hands that were used to holding plowshares and ax handles and cleaning rags were now holding pencils in the UN Declaration of Human Rights and the South Carolina State Constitution. The objective of the citizenship schools was always to connect education to changing the conditions around you. Long before knowing the term popular education, Robinson had the students talk. She asked them about the vegetables they were growing in their gardens. What tools did they use? She had them make up stories about things they wanted to do or something they might want to order from a catalog. And then she would write the story down in their own words and use that story to teach reading. Within three months, that first night school tripled in size and 80% of the participants passed the literacy test and registered to vote. And in four years, black voters on Johns Island grew from 30 to nearly 700, and people developed the collective power to push for structural improvements in their community, getting roads built, schools improved, and health care facilities. Some years later, near Irvin, Tennessee, another community voice, Hobart's story, was upset about a dump in his community of Bumpus Cove. On his own, he started monitoring the trucks going into this one holler and talking about his concerns to his friends and neighbors and family. Two of the women who listened, Mary Lee Rogers and Gail Story, who first and only regarded themselves as housewives with nothing to contribute, became researchers, activists, and organizers. Highlander helped community members learn how to research public records to find out what was going in that dump, the names of the chemicals, the amounts, the impact on the environment and the people. And strengthened with that knowledge and information, the community came together and got the dump closed. Mary Lee Rogers tells that when the head of solid waste management was presented with their research, he asked, who did this for you? He was amazed, she said, that we could get that from his files, and actually, I'm a little amazed myself. Bumpus Cove organizer Gail Story echoes the sentiment. I didn't like the way I was. 
And at my first workshop at Highlander, I was scared to death. I thought, Lord, they don't want to hear anything I've got to say. But gradually, I started talking. And I found out they were interested in what I had to say. I had accomplished some things they hadn't thought about. And we started sharing with each other all the things that we had learned. There are many places today where community voices are rising to the occasion and doing the extraordinary. And one of those is the bravery of immigrant youth who are doing their own kind of coming out as undocumented. As 18, 19, and 20 year olds who have been here since they were four, five, or six, what does it mean to send them back home to say that theirs is not a community voice? A couple of years ago, I stood in the crowd in Washington, D.C., welcoming four young Trail of Dreams marchers who had just finished a courageous and strenuous four-month, 1,500-mile march and educational campaign from Miami to D.C. in support of the DREAM Act. The DREAM Act would address education access for immigrant youth. Miami to D.C., 1,500 miles. One of the marchers was Felipe Matos, and he was speaking to the vast crowd as I walked up. And he said, there is this song. I've been singing it on this march, and it has helped me get through. And he started singing the We Are Not Afraid verse of We Shall Overcome. Felipe sang those words 51 years after they were birthed in a library at Highlander by another young person working for justice. It was July 1959 and Grundy County sheriffs had just raided the Highlander Folk School because of its work against segregation and had cut off the electricity. 13-year-old Mary Ethel Dozier of the Montgomery Improvement Association sat in that dark library and started singing a church song that had evolved into a movement song and out of her fear added the new verse, we are not afraid, we are not afraid, we are not afraid today. So a youth from the Jim Crow South creates a verse to We Shall Overcome, a song that go, has gone around the world from Ireland to South Africa to Thailand and comes back to an immigration rally in front of the White House where just months before it had been sung inside the White House during Black History Month. And Highlander is woven into every decade, every generation, and even every part of the globe of that story. And who else comes to Highlander today? They are youth converging from the Deep South, Appalachia, and immigrant communities, addressing juvenile justice and education issues. They are former coal miners working to stop mountaintop removal. They are the displaced going back to the Gulf still to work on restoration and rebuilding after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. They are immigrants working to stop the impact of re repressive legislation in their communities and work for passage of fair and just immigration policies. They are women labor educators from the Middle East and North Africa. They are organizers from Haiti trying to stop child servitude. They are rural and small town people exploring new economic models. They are farm workers forming associations. They are poultry workers organizing a union. They are students and faculty. All of these stories have a similar theme that is crucial, and that is making a choice with your voice. After you've been shot at by machine guns, do you hide in a ditch or do you stand up and sing? When they threaten you for teaching people to read and write, do you close up shop or keep teaching? When you know that dump is full of poison and no one listens to you, do you stop talking or keep working? When you are threatened with deportation, do you hide or go march? Highlander has helped people answer that question for 80 years, and it is based on our commitment to deep listening. What are the opportunities and challenges for deep listening in this technologically advanced, fast-paced world? With so many more ways to communicate, how do we make sure we are still listening to ourselves and to each other? There's a Cuban proverb that says, listening looks easy, but it's not simple. Every head is a world. And Winston Churchill said, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. 
One of the gifts of current modern neuroscience is that we now understand that many areas of the brain are involved in listening. It is not a passive act. And thus, skillful listening actually involves a very complex set of activities. So becoming a skillful listener requires learning to do it. And technology definitely brings both pitfalls and possibilities in our connections. But sometimes I think it's less about the technology itself and more about our role and our relationship to that technology and our commitments on how we use it and how we treat each other. Despite the way we're tied to our Blackberries and our iPhones, at Highlander, we are seeing and hearing that people want connection. They want to talk to each other. So one of the ways we meet the challenge of deep listening is to create those spaces, keep bringing people together, keep introducing people to each other, keep creating those spaces at our workshop center and in communities where people can talk to each other, develop relationships, develop strategies, develop actions. We also work on developing a spirit of inquiry. And this kind of um, a tone and atmosphere we see so much in the public media, we are working consciously to approach from the spirit of inquiry instead of reactivity learning to listen and listening in order to learn. And a third way we do it is to continue to honor people's experiences and their stories. Stories matter because they remind us that the forces of injustice are strong in every generation, and every generation offers us examples of ordinary people doing extraordinary things for the long haul to fight that injustice. Stories matter because they lift up examples of people making change and help us feel inspired and hopeful. They matter because they offer solutions to problems that other people have faced. Our stories matter because they make our history fuller and richer and help us to know we are part of this thing of ordinary people in extraordinary times doing remarkable things. Perhaps Gail's story, who once believed she had nothing of value to say, sums it up best I feel like I'm on the path to destiny, and mine's not to be shut up. And now in the spirit of Highlander's methodology and the spirit of this Community Voices series, I'd like to welcome your thoughts and hear your voice. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you, Pam, for helping us to understand and share your insight that uh, where one voice might be drowned out or frightened into silence, the voices of a community can join together and make themselves heard. On behalf of Community Voices uh, and the broader community, um, we'd like to extend our thanks and congratulations to you and the Highland Center uh, for 80 years of commitment to, and service to the community. Um, my name is Sarah Lyon Hill. Uh, I am a doctoral student in planning, governance, and globalization. Uh, I was a, I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer uh, and a member of Community Voices. Uh, during my time in Niger, I kind of experienced a lot of what you discussed tonight, and really, and really that the work that matters is the creating of space. Um, and really helping people to learn, to learn together, to work together, so that we can finally act. Um, today, Highlander Center is still committed to listening to the voices of the community and lifting them up. And Pam, we really greatly appreciate your leadership and vision for all of this. So thank you. <laughs> Just before we get to our second part of our presentation tonight, um, there is a table outside in the lobby with books, uh, DVDs, CDs that come from Highland, Highlander Center, um, and we would encourage you to look through those um, after the presentation. Um, and now in the spirit of all of this, we will turn this over to you, the audience, to um, provide your voices, your comments, your questions to Pam. Um, and uh, if you would, please raise your hand, and then we will have one of our lovely Community Voices uh, team members bring a microphone to you so that your voice is clearly heard. Okay, good. So I thought if there are hands, we might um, go ahead and get, you know, three to five questions out in the room before 
and see what people are interested in talking about. So are there questions or comments? Yes. And, and would you, yeah, there's, they're going to bring you a mic. And Do you mind say who you are? And Hi, my name is Nick Copeland, um, and uh, I work here at the university in the sociology department. And I'm very impressed with this idea, this model of direct democracy, that, that it seems like there's a long tradition of really working with people and listening to them. And I think it's, uh, you know, political parties, a lot of uh, kinds of traditional social movements don't actually listen to people. They kind of come in with different solutions for them and have something prepackaged and try to get people to sign on. And I think this is really amazing and inspiring to see this. Um, I'm also interested in your discussion about working across lines of race and dealing with issues um, that are con facing people like uh, dream activists and people who are here as immigrants. And working with ordinary people, we also have a lot of ordinary biases. And you know, I know from being around my family or being around different friends, like there are a lot of prejudices that come up. What are some of the things that you can do or that have worked in overcoming some of these, you know, people feel like, well, you shouldn't be here. Um, this kind of ordinary racism or ordinary prejudice, what are some of the things that have worked um, kind of on the ground to overcome those problems? Okay. Good question. Let's, let's get a couple more and then we'll... Or do you want me to go ahead and say something? A couple more questions? Yes, please. My name is John Lowe, and I live here in Blacksburg. I'd be interested in knowing more about what kind of um, attacks or opposition has been made against the Highlander Center by outsiders, and if that's still continuing in some form today, or how recently they have taken place. One more for this round. Okay, well, to the first question about lines of race and getting, you know, facilitating processes that help people work together across the lines of differences and the way you bump up. So um, our starting point is that we're, we're going to trip over things because we all grow up in this, you know, this, this society that very much is based on, you know, racism, sexism, homophobia heterosexism, homophobia, all that is still very much alive and still very much a part of the structure and fabric of our culture. So, um, but we also invite people with the belief and intention that we're all showing up with some kind of common purpose about trying to make change. So one of the ways uh, Miles Horton in the long haul talks about you can't really, you can't talk somebody out of something or get somebody to move intellectually. What do you do is create a space where somebody has to act different. So they're in a situation that might be different and they have to, and so we intentionally bring people together across race, across issues. So one of our leadership programs and our Seeds of Fire Youth program does this too. We're intentionally uh, creating a room where there are people from the Deep South, people from immigrant communities, people from Appalachia. And so sometimes, like in during our Threads Leadership Institute, there was a quote from Septima Clark in the first part of the film. I know I'm not weaving my life's patterns alone. And we named a, a leadership and an organizing school after that, uh, just threads, because of those connections. So people from the Deep South, people from immigrant communities, people from Appalachia were all together. And, and we're in, at Highlander in the middle of a session. And there's a raid in Western North Carolina. And 600 immigrant workers were impacted by that raid. And so. Um, there, were, there were people from those communities in the Threads workshop at Highlander at the time of the raid. And then there were also people just asking the question, yeah, that's bad, but what's it got to do with me? And why are they here anyway? And how did they get here? So we stopped. And we tried to create, and we watched a film, and we created a dialogue, and we um, just created the space for them to work it out, to provide some tools and work it out. And the women, you know, who raised the questions and said, what does this have to do with me, ended up saying, wow, I get this in some way that I'd never thought about before. And, and I know how to talk about it now. When I go to the grocery store and somebody says something, I, I, I know some things that I can say and how to talk about it. So, so we, we also try to help people um, frame it in that being safe and being comfortable are two different things. You can be entirely safe but be uncomfortable because somebody says something that makes you think, makes you stretch, 
you know, make you grow. So we, 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 we start with that some of these things are going to bubble up and that, and that, and they're going to bubble up because we are also trying to build a movement where people are invited to bring their full selves. So it, it definitely comes up in our work and, 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 um, and, and the room also, it's not, it, it's the, you know, people in the room also working with each other help hold that space to help break down what's happening, why that thing, you know, why what that person said was, was not, you know, needed to be talked about further and to be able to help look at something from the other side. So putting, putting, putting people in working relationships with each other, we, we find is really, really critical. So in Highlander, was uh, one of the first and few places in the South where black and white people came together across race to dismantle uh, into, uh, segregation and to work for a, a more racially just society and was targeted because of that and the property in the late 50s and early 60s actually seized and uh, the original property was seized and, and um, um, Highlander moved across state to a house in Knoxville and then out to the present property where we are now in 1971. And, we, you know, so we don't have that kind of thing, uh, a question about harassment. We don't have that kind of thing um, now, but we do still get some unannounced visits sometimes from unfriendly folks. And, and our thing is just mainly be, uh, we don't want to be a gated community, so we have a way to lock uh, uh, block a driveway, but we don't do it very often unless we, you know, we do kind of have a, a lock up and light up security protocols if we know there's going to be a Klan rally in Knoxville or as a couple of years ago, there a Klan Nazi rally happened in Knoxville. That is the combination of right wing groups that led to the, uh, the murders in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1979. So, so we don't, uh, we, we try not to overreact, but we try to watch our backs. Our, we have security protocols as staff. People are always more important than buildings. Um, we get drugged through some internet mud sometimes. Sometimes the staff person will speak at something, and then we'll see an excerpt from their, you know, speech on some right-wing websites. And, and we do have people, you know, with bumper stickers sometimes show up, come in the office, and ask questions like, do you work with illegals? Are you working? Do you support President Obama? Do you, you know, trying to get certain answers or, or people will, you know, just drive up and I know one time I was telling somebody the story about something that had happened in this pickup truck. Well, we were actually down at the, trying to decide, okay, how are we going to block this wide thing? We don't want to gate all the time, but how are we going to want to shut it when we want to? Our answer was this long cable. But, um, and so I'm telling this story to somebody and this pickup goes by, you know, got the, got the guns in the back and, and I just, I just said, you know, said, hey, how you doing? Can I help you? And he said, well, some, some of them said, some, uh, some of them said y'all were up here. I'm just driving through. Some of them said y'all were up here. And I was like, who's some of them <laughs> and who's y'all? Because, you know, so, um, so I, you know, as, as the director, I, I try to take the standpoint that five years from now, I want to look back and laugh at being overcautious than to look back with regret. So we, we do, um, you know, since I've been there, there's been a couple of times when we've lit up and locked up just, you know, in terms of what's going on, on around us. So. But uh, nothing like what Highlander's seen in the past. So. Other questions? How are we doing, Andy, on time? Okay. Yes, uh, we get a microphone right here. Thank you, Pam, for being here. Thank you. Um, and for sharing the history. Uh, my name is Bob Leonard. I teach over at Tech. Um, and the last two questions have led me to think about, um, or to, yeah, to think about the fact that we're living in a time which has, uh, is characterized as polarized, as, as, as having left and right. Mm -hmm. um, and the questions of civil rights, race, oppression, really don't have any kind of direct connection with left or right. Um, and yet, nowadays, I think there is a great loss in, um, in the effort to seek justice 
by framing everything in left and right frames. But it's hard to bucket. And I was wondering if you have any insights or strategies that you're thinking about or others are thinking about that you could share. So um, I think it's important not to write people off. And I'm hearing, you know, that there's in this, it, it, it is polarized. I think the media plays a really strong role in that polarization. I think that the, you know, seeing the results of the elections come through and just what the, the, the amount of money that was thrown at misinformation and voter suppression tactics and to see what people went through to exercise their constitutional right to vote, standing in line for eight hours. And that was all very moving to me and gave me some hope that maybe um, not left or right, but those of us who care about living in a, you know, a more fair and just society, that there might be more of us than I thought. And so, um, so the... I think that the, the and, and this is why I think that, that um, getting people in the room who wouldn't ordinarily be in the same room together, it's small in numbers, but it has ripple effects. And, it's, and, and I, as it happens in many communities, it's not just happening at Highlander. We know it's happening here in Blattsburg and other places, you know, across the south in the country. So I, I think that, that um, um, j just you know, that, it, that it's so important to try to find that common humanity and not write people off because of, you know, I've got somebody in my family member that I dearly love who voted for Obama and watches Fox. I want that family member brought, in the, wor in the world I'm working for, I want that family member in that. I'd like her to watch less Fox, but I, st I still want her in the, you know, in the world that I'm Thank you so much. Really. Really my pleasure to be here with you this evening.